We're not just changing the way people look at church, but the way people look at faith and humanity. This is the FSC Global. All right, so first off, first start. Check this out. Uh, I want to let you guys know uh, we are having prayer every Monday at 5 a.m. The Zoom link will be in the description below. I just want to let you know we're having prayer on Mondays at 5 a.m. We used to have it at uh, 7 p.m. Um, but I want us to actually like get this prayer in like at the top of the morning. I know it's going to be tough for some people, okay? But 7 o'clock was tough for some people, so you know what? It don't even matter. Every Monday morning at 5 a.m. we're going to be praying um, over the word that was that was preached um, on Sunday over the visions and the callings on our lives individually as well as collectively and um, I need you guys there like I want you to be a part of what we do and who we are there was something incredibly important that um, one of my favorite people said her name is uh, Carol Shirai she said you can always tell of the strength of someone's ministry by the people who show up for prayer so i want us to be able to show up to pray over each other to pray over our homes to pray over our ministry to pray over the things that we do and who we are every monday morning 5 a.m can't wait to see you there we need you hey what's up y'all listen i want to invite you all to our resurrection game day on april 9th at 3 p.m okay we're gonna have space we have pool a whole bunch of games we just want to come and celebrate the resurrection together so your games so if you're interested type in i'm in can't wait to see y'all i really really want to see y'all all right this is the fsc global Whoa. What's up, what's up, what's up, what's up, y'all? Welcome, welcome, welcome to the FSC Global, your digital pit stop, changing the way that we see faith in humanity. Listen, happy Resurrection Sunday, happy Easter, whatever you want to call it today, okay? This is the day that we celebrate Jesus' resurrection. So, ah, <laughs> happy Resurrection Sunday, y'all. Listen, I'm so happy. Um, today, we are going to be celebrating Resurrection Sunday, of course, but we're also going to be starting our new series for this month called, But What Did Jesus Say? Screaming and yelling was the expression of anger from our parents. And then silence was the sound of disappointment from our parents. Our issue is that we take the way that we grew up and then we reflect that against our relationship with God. So this, uh, this series is, I've been thinking about this series for a while now as we're going to be diving very, very deep into uh, the things that we do as a, a community of believers, as, as Christians, the things that we practice, the things that we say, the things that we say that we believe. And we're going to actually measure those things against what Jesus actually said and did. This is going to be pretty uncomfortable for a lot of us. <laughs> It is, but I'm, I'm excited about it. I am so excited about revealing God's truth, revealing the, um, the, authentic, the authenticity of the gospel of Jesus Christ and doing it in a way that just illuminates it for us. So uh, strap in. Let's get this. Let's get it. Let's get it. Let's just go straight into it. Um, turn into your Bibles to... Matthew 28. This will be the last chapter in the book of Matthew. Matthew 28. Uh, ba -ba -ba. We're going to start at verse number 16. Verse number 16. Oh, yo. Still can't wait to see you guys today at 3 p.m. It's going to be our resurrection game day. I really, really hope y'all come and join us. Uh, if you don't got the, uh, the information already, just comment. I'm in and then you'll get all of the information to come join us today. Can't wait to see y'all. So Matthew 28 verse 16 and it says, Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. 
And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am always with you. I am with you always to the end of the age. Whew. So today we're going to be speaking from the subject. What's your job description? Father God, you are holy. You are righteous. You are good. You are brilliant. You are genius. You are perfect. Uh, may your words be, be coming out of my mouth. All of your words be coming out of my, my mouth for this, uh, for this sermon, for this, this talk, for this time that we have today. And uh, God, just do your thing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes. Yeah, so what's your job description? Now, I remember, ooh, this is going to be interesting. I remember the first time I got um, um, a, a job, a, a legal job. Not like a job, like, not, not, that I, not that I did everything illegal before I got it. The first job I got that gave me like a W-2 or a 1099. Let's just go there, right? First job I got, when um, I got offered the position, um, they listed out everything that I'd be doing for my job and, you know, just listing stuff like, uh, simple stuff like taking out the trash or cleaning out something or like just anything. But everything that I would do in my job would be, um, listed in this job description. Now I was in the back room at Target, so the list wasn't too long. It wasn't long at all. But even before you get the job, when you're applying for a certain position, they will list out the job description of everything that you'd be responsible for doing. Now I don't know how uh, like how your jobs are, but every job that I've gotten, my supervisor was very strict on doing my job um, and not trying to do <laughs> someone else's job or me doing my job, my job description to the best of my ability. That's always been any supervisor that I've ever had growing up that they've been really strict on that. Do your job. I've heard that a whole lot. Hey, do your job. Well, one, one morning, it's about 4.30 a.m. I'm clocking into my job at Target and I'm walking toward the back room and I see uh, one of my coworkers in the aisle where the toys are. And they're, they're struggling. They can't get the toys to the top of, um, um, of the shelf. They didn't have a ladder. So I went over there and I helped them out. They had like a whole lot of toys to get over there. So I was about over there helping them out for maybe like 15, 20, maybe even 25 minutes just helping them get everything up. After I was finished, I go back to the back room and my supervisor goes off on me. He's like, why are you so late? I'm like, chill. I was helping somebody do something in the, in the toys aisle. My supervisor looks me in the eye and he says, that's not your job. Your job is to be here in the back room at 4.30 a.m. so we can make sure we have enough toys to go to that aisle. Now we're going to be late open in the store this morning and they're going to think it's because we were late in the back room when the reality is it was on the floor. I was about 19 years old at the time. So I was like, man, whatever. But how many of us has ever thought that we were doing someone a service when in reality we were just doing someone else's job while there was no one in position to do ours? You ever catch yourself doing somebody else's job, trying to make things go faster, trying to help, trying to be of assistance? Have you ever found yourself trying to do God's job? Yeah. You see, while I was reading the scripture, I was continuously thinking, like, what is Jesus's job description? Like, what is Jesus here for? He was, you know, born of a virgin, lived his life, created his ministry, healed, set people free, uh, withstood the devil, died for us, he was resurrected. All of that was in his job description. After he was resurrected, 
all he had to do was go sit at this, the right hand side of God. But he found it necessary to come back to his disciples one last time. Which is great because there was one last thing that he needed to give to his disciples before he left. Now, all over the globe, as believers, we're going to be celebrating and talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Like today is Easter. Everybody's going to church. Okay. Everybody's going to church, learning about the resurrection. Everybody have a Sunday dinner. Like this, this is the thing that happens. And we always talk about his resurrection. But I really, really want us to dig into why did he come back to the disciples after he was resurrected? He just spent the last three years uh, investing and pouring into his disciples who are now apostles. And he's poured everything he has, everything he is into these gentlemen, into uh, Mary and Mary Magdalene. He's, he's poured himself into just about everyone he's come in contact with. So why has it been necessary? Why was it necessary for him to come back and then show himself again to his disciples? Now, in the Bible, there were a number of believers, people who believed that Jesus was the Christ, that he was the Messiah. Once he died on the cross, they didn't necessarily believe in his resurrection. So like, it's, it's easy to believe, okay, this is Jesus, this is the prophet, or this is Jesus, this is the, uh, the Messiah, or this is Jesus, this is the healer. It is a completely different thing to believe this is Jesus, this is God. Even beforehand, Jesus showed himself after his resurrection to a few, of his, a few of his disciples, and they didn't believe that it was him. They treated him as if, as if he was another person. If there is one thing that will separate the real ones from the fake ones in our faith, it is the fact of knowing that our faith is not necessarily told. It's shown. Hundreds of millions of people will celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ today but not so much tomorrow. We will believe that our faith is the answer today, but not so much tomorrow. For a lot of us, seeing is believing, and unfortunately, we only allow ourselves to believe about three or four times a year. So Jesus has to show himself to his disciples one more time, just to hammer that last nail in. This is our faith. This is what we stand on. And even then, when they saw him on the mountain, the word said that they worshiped him, but some didn't believe, but some doubted. Is it possible to believe and doubt God at the same time? Is it possible to worship and doubt at the same time? Have you ever caught yourself inside of a service, inside of church, inside of your own prayer time, praying to God, worshiping God and in the back of your mind? There is doubt of the things that you're telling them. There is doubt in the things that you're singing about. There is doubt in the praises and the worship that you're giving to God. Has that ever happened to you? This is where the disciples are. Like, just imagine yourself being a disciple. You walk with, with this dude for about three and a half years. He, you, you've been told that he's the Messiah. You've seen him do all of these miracles. But there is this one thing that you have never seen happen before. You've never seen him come back from death. Even with Lazarus, you didn't see Lazarus die. Even with the child whose father came to Jesus, you didn't see that child die. You saw Jesus get hanged on the cross. You saw him take his last breath. Is it out of the realm of possibility that you would doubt him coming back to you? <laughs> we, love, we love to talk down on the disciples for not believing that Jesus was back, of not believing that Jesus was resurrected. But what if that were us? <laughs> Sometimes it's us today. How many times do we have a hard time believing in the things that Jesus says about us and the things that God says about us, thus having doubt in him? This is why Jesus shows himself again to his disciples. He's like Kobe in 2010. Job's not finished. Job finished? No, I don't think so. But Jesus knows that there is doubt within his strongest believers. Just think his disciples are his strongest believers. These are the ones who were the closest to him. And there's doubt in their heart about his resurrection, even though they've seen him. So Jesus has to give them a reminder. He says to them, all authority in heaven and on earth belongs to me. 
all authority. <laughs> that means the power to judge, control, command, and determine belongs to Jesus. And there's a reason why he's saying it this way, because he's reminding his disciples of what he said back in John 14. He said, listen, everything that I have done, everything that I am doing, you can do, and you can do better, you can do more. All you have to do is believe in me. Take it all the way back to us being uh, created in God's image. Jesus is saying, I have all authority in heaven and on earth, which means you have authority in heaven and on earth. And then what I want you to do with that authority is to go out and make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You have the authority to do so because I'm giving you my authority. That is your job description. Your job description is not to make people believe in you. Your job description is not to make people go to church. Your job description is not to judge them for doing something wrong. Your job description is not to make up rules that has nothing to do with Jesus. Your job is not to create a hierarchy of people who you believe deserve salvation. Your job is not to determine who deserves to be forgiven. Your job is not to determine what someone should wear. Your job is not to determine how someone should speak. Your job description, our job description, is to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What is a disciple? A disciple is a pupil, a student, or a follower. Our job is to create people who willingly follow Jesus Christ, not to coerce them to do so. You know, the thing about us doing our jobs, you know, in our job description, is that if we do so, we are not at risk of doing someone else's job. We're not at risk of being out of place. We're not at risk of being disobedient to the word that God has spoken over our lives. As believers of Jesus Christ, it is our job, our job description to create other people who will become believers of Jesus Christ. It's not to be Jesus Christ. Jesus came back to show his disciples, show everything that we talked about. Put your hand right here. Like everything that we talked about is true. Everything that I said that I was, everything that I showed you that I was is real. Now, your job is to go out and do the same things that we were doing for the past three years by yourself. And you won't even be by yourself because I'm, I'm going to leave you with a comforter, the Holy Spirit. I'll be with you until the end of age, Jesus Christ. You will always have the authority of God when you follow and be obedient to the word that was given to you. When we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we're not just celebrating that he got up. We're celebrating that he's revealed inside of us. We're celebrating that the abilities that he had when he walked this earth, we now have. That's what we're celebrating. <laughs> so the next time you're thinking about doing something because you're annoyed or because you think this is the right way to do it or because you think this is the way that it's supposed to be, I need you to ask yourself a question. What's my job description? Father God, you are righteous. You are risen. You have been resurrected. You have been given the right hand to God. You are amazing. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for, uh, man, we thank you for being such a sacrifice for us that the things that we would have to do to be forgiven, the things that we would have to do to have a relationship with God, we don't have to do. Thank you for taking every single stripe. Thank you for taking every single whip, every single drop of blood, every single wound that we would have to take for our sins. Thank you for putting us in a position to have a relationship with God, a healthy relationship with God. Thank you for showing us pure in God's eyes because of your sacrifice. Jesus, there is, <laughs> wow, Jesus, there is nothing that we can do 
without you because we have to go through you for everything. And we are appreciative of it and we are knowledgeable of it. <laughs> and we're thankful for it. Father God, uh, we thank you. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that you've given us for our comforter, our decision maker, our confidant, um, our critical thinker. We thank you for equipping us with such um, a variety of weapons, such a, a variety of skills, such a variety of tools to better worship you, to better praise you, and to better do the job that you've called us to do to make disciples. Father God, endow us with your love that we may share that love with other people and give us the ability and the creativity to continuously do your work. We love you and we're thankful. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey Amen. We love you, God. I love you so much more. Go out there and create something. Hey, listen, 3 p.m. today, all right? Say I'm in, you'll get the address and everything. Just comment. Hey, I want to see y'all. I want to see you. See y'all today. See y'all later. This is the FSC Global.